Hi everyone, thanks for sticking around on a Friday evening for us here in Australia and uh, I guess Thursday for some people and I'm not going to even bother listing off all the different places people are. But um, yeah, thanks especially to the organizers for the invitation. Um, this is my first online um, conference so it's, it's really exciting to see how this technology works. So thank you guys for uh, organizing this, all your hard work. Um, I just wanted to say that sort of, um, you know, thinking in the spirit of a workshop, some of these ideas are still pretty rough form. Um, so we're looking forward to the discussion um, and getting some feedback from, from all the people who are, who are involved in this conversation. So um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna jump right in. Okay, so what I wanna do today is talk a bit about um, Bayesian models, in particular about modeling Bayesian computation in the brain. I'll talk about what that distinction means in a second. Um, so what I wanted to do is, sorry, let me just pick something here. So I'll set things up a little bit. I'll give some background on um, Bayesian modeling, sort of Bayes, Bayes um, rule. Talk a little bit about applications in cognitive, in cognitive and brain sciences. And then I'll move on to specifically focus on a recent paper by Colombo and Hartman. Um, that is, is quite interesting and raises some interesting sort of issues that um, some of which I will we'll agree with and some of which we will um, disagree with. Um, and this is a paper that came out in 2015, the online um, version of BJPS, but it's also, I think, just recently came out in print in 2017. So all the references to Columbo and Hartman are to the 2017 in print edition, but um, many of you will have seen the 2015 paper. So they're, they're, they're the one and the same. Um, so then we'll get to some challenges and then I'll just sort of wrap up. Okay, so I should also say that although the talks focus on Bayesian modeling in cognitive science, um, the hope is that some of the issues that I raise um, are more broadly relevant to a range of different probabilistic approaches, including um, perhaps um, hierarchical Bayesian modeling or predictive coding. Um, so, okay, so moving on then. So Bayes' rule, um, it's probably familiar to most of you. I'm just gonna very briefly talk about what it is, it's just as, by way of background. So Bayesian inference is a type of statistical inference where data or new information is used to update the probability that a given hypothesis is true. A system performs Bayesian inference if it applies Bayes' rule to update the probability that a hypothesis H is true given some data D. Bayes' rule states that the probability of a hypothesis given the data, so PHD, the posterior, is the probability of the data given the hypothesis, the likelihood, times the prior probability of the hypothesis, the prior, divided by the probability of the data. And the latter um, just ensures that the resulting probability is sum to one. So Bayes' rule alone doesn't specify how an agent's beliefs or percepts um, or actions um, should be used to generate a decision, action, or percept. Um, Bayesian decision theory specifies how to use the posterior distribution to generate a decision, and it requires um, a loss or a utility function, which, which specifies the expected loss for each action or percept. Um, the action with the minimum expected loss is the best action that the agent can take given her beliefs. And now, Cognitive scientists have been um, increasingly using Bayesian decision theory as a modeling framework to address a broad range of different phenomena. So now I just wanna walk you through an example very quickly. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I just wanna walk you through an example to sort of illustrate how, the, uh, how Bayesian decision theory is applied in um, contemporary cognitive science. So this is um, a study from Cording and Wolpert from 2004. Um, where they were applying a uh, sort of Bayesian modeling approach to sensory motor learning. Right. So in the task um, sort of depicted on the left-hand panels, um, I don't know if I can use arrows, 
I don't seem to be able to point with my arrows, so I'm just going to have to describe the panels. Um, subjects are asked to perform a variation on a standard visual motor adaptation task. So subjects are asked to reach, to make a bunch of reaches to visual targets on a screen. And you can kind of, you can see a depiction of the screen, um, again, on the left hand, bottom left hand um, side. So as the finger moves from the starting circle, the cursor representing the hand position is extinguished and shifted laterally from the true finger position. And this is a pretty standard kind of um, perturbation to, to investigate visual motor adaptation or learning um, when the mapping between visual feedback and um, the real hand position is manipulated in some way. And so the innovative sort of step that Cording and Wolper took is um, instead of the shift being fixed across the entire session, as you could kind of, you, you might have encountered if you've ever read a paper on like prism adaptation, something like that. Um, in this paradigm, the shifts on each trial were drawn from a distribution of shifts with a, with a characteristic mean and standard deviation. Um, another detail is important is that the hand was never visible to subjects. And so halfway to the target, when, they're, when the subjects are reaching to the target, feedback of some sort is, to, is provided very briefly. Um, and that's represented in those four panels um, with basically different point clouds. So you see in the purple box is sigma zero, which is the veridical feedback condition, the condition in which feedback about the um, shift is, is reliable. Um, just represented by a single cursor um, over the shifted um, hand position. He's going down, you get to sigma uh, moderate, which is uh, sigma m moderate, which is a point cloud that's that's um, centered over the shifted the, the real shift value, but there's some noise or uncertainty um, associated with that feedback. And then you get to sigma l, which is even more um, uncertainty. And then you get to um, sigma infinity, which is unlimited um, uncertainty, where there's no visual feedback provided during the course of the movement. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And the subjects are required to, to try to, to reach as quickly and as accurately as possible to place the cursor on the final reach target in, indicated by green in the top panel. And basically compensate for the imposed lateral shift. So that's the idea. Okay, so they tested three models. They tested a full compensation model that's sort of on the upper, upper right-hand side, um, where increasing the uncertainty of the feedback, again, those, those, those different colored panels from purple to green, um, would affect the variability of the pointing, but not the average location. So that's what you're seeing with basically a flat, um, a flat deviation across the, the different shifts. So wider, um, Increased variability indicated by the sort of shaded green bar um, around deviation from target, some more variability, um, but no change relative to the different um, shift shift amounts or visual feedback conditions. Um, so crucially, this model doesn't require subjects to estimate their visual uncertainty or the prior distribution of shifts. According to the Bayesian model, uh, by contrast. Um, which is depicted in the center, uh, subjects optimally use information about the prior distribution and the uncertainty of visual feedback to estimate the lateral shift. The mapping model, the third model, um, and so that's indicated by those different um, lines with different slopes, um, sorry, in the Bayesian model. Um, the mapping model involves learning a mapping from the visual feedback to an estimate of the lateral shift. So basically by minimizing the error over repeated trials, subjects achieve a uh, basically a, a combination similar to the Bayesian model, but without any explicit representation of the prior distribution of visual uncertainty. Um, the problem with that model is that learning um, such a mapping requires knowledge of the endpoint error, um, but that's not, re that's not revealed on all of the conditions. It's only revealed on the, um, on the sigma zero conditions. And so if subjects learn a mapping, they can only do so for the trials um, that for those trials, so for the sigma zero trials, and they can't do it for any other conditions that involve blurred feedback. Um, okay. So the mapping model predicts that the average shift of the response towards the mean of the prior should be the same for all amounts of blur. So basically you don't get any kind of um, 
condition by condition um, separation in, in endpoint error or deviation from target. Okay. And so, and so basically they provided evidence for, um, which you can see down in the lower right hand plots where increasing perceptual uncertainty, so increasing the amount of blur on the visual feedback at the midpoint of the reach increases the weight or the reliance on the prior. So on the prior distribution of shifts that the subjects were encountering. And um, you know, without sort of dwelling too much on it, the other two models were ruled out. This model was a, a, a provided a, a, a very good fit for the for the behavioral data. Um, and so the conclusion they want to draw from this is that subjects internally represent both the statistical distribution of the task and their sensory uncertainty, combining them in a manner consistent with a performance optimizing Bayesian process. The central nervous system therefore implies probabilistic models during sensory motor learning. Right, so that's the conclusion. And although this might seem like a bit of an overreach, um, we're going to argue that under certain conditions, information about underlying computations and representations can be inferred on the basis of um, behavioral evidence, evidence alone. Okay. All right. So that's sort of an example, I think sort of really a seminal example of application of Bayesian decision theory to, um, to account for um, sensory motor learning data. Okay, so now just sort of stepping back um, and saying something about this overarch, so basically to come up with a set of distinctions that I think are useful for, for framing the, the discussion to follow. So um, there's a distinction that um, Piccinini and um, also Van Gelder drew um, between computational and computational modeling or computable and computational modeling. And here's what Piccinini has to say about it. To the first approximation, the distinction we need is between using a computational description to model the behavior of a system, such as when meteorologists predict the weather using computers, and using it to explain the behavior of a system, such as when computer scientists explain what computers do by appealing to the programs that they execute. Piccinini goes on to say, in computational modeling, the outputs of a computing system C are used to describe some behavior of another system S under some conditions. In computational explanation, by contrast, some behavior of a system S is explained by a particular kind of process internal to S, a computation, and by the properties of that computation. And so for similar reasons, it's important to distinguish between Bayesian modeling and Bayesian computation. Okay, so Bayesian modeling uses decision theory, uses de Bayesian modeling uses Bayesian decision theory to account for behavioral phenomena without any further commitments to brain actually representing probability distributions or performing probabilistic inference. Um, so maybe another way of framing this is to sort of talk about these models or this way of approaching um, the use of Bayesian models as, as, as being a purely descriptive or a phenomenological or even a normative uh, modeling approach. Um, by contrast, Bayesian computation involves, involves providing evidence for the Bayesian coding hypothesis, uh, namely the hypothesis that the brain represents information probabilistically by coding and computing with probability density functions or approximations to probability density functions. Right, and I think the, the, the claim that, that I think um, falls out of that is that this is a relatively straightforward mechanistic explanatory project, at least, at least to our minds. Um, I don't mean straightforward in the sense that it's straightforward to get answers to what the neural mechanisms are that underpin these, um, these, these behaviors, but that the, there's no sort of in principle um, barriers to describing mechanistic explanations, and that that's also an objective of this modeling approach. Okay, and so the reason this is important is because the widespread success of Bayesian modeling in accommodating um, behavioral data or even in predicting new um, behavioral data um, across a wide range of domains, including perception, multisensory integration, sensory motor learning, et cetera, doesn't ensure that the brain performs Bayesian computation. So I think the, uh, so now just kind of 
saying something about the main claims that we want to defend in the paper. So that's sort of by way of, uh, we're going to really be focusing on um, evidence for Bayesian computation, kind of set aside the sort of Bayesian modeling approach that's sort of much more noncommittal about, um, uh, about the sort of the brain actually performing um, probabilistic inference. So the claims we're going to defend um, today are, are threefold. So this behavioral neural data can place pr fruitful constraints on the search space for possible mechanisms. So they provide a valuable heuristic for mechanism discovery. And here we're going to agree with Colombo and Hartman. Um, these data can simultaneously provide evidential support that improves the quality of the mechanistic explanation a model provides, helping to transform it from a how possibly mechanism to a mechanism sketch to a well-supported mechanism schema. Um, and these are not separable, at least to our eyes, these are not separable or independent results, the two sides of the same coin. Okay, so before we get there, before we get to sort of the specific um, claims that Colombo and Hartman make and then to the challenges um, that we want to um, level, I wanted to address another way of thinking about the explanatory value of Bayesian modeling um, that I think is not particularly useful. Um, it's also a place where we, um, where, where we align with Colombo and Hartman. So I think it's worth kind of um, stepping through that very quickly. Okay, so I think it's a kind of a widespread idea in the literature, um, both the literature in, in um, cognitive science amongst neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists who use these kinds of models, people who are modeling psychophysical data, for example, and also philosophers of, of cognitive science who are also interested in Bayesian models to really tie um, unification to explanation. So here's a couple passages. Probabilistic models provide a unifying framework for explaining the inferences that people make in different settings. Bayesian decision theory offers a unifying mathematical language for framing cognition as the solution to inductive problems. One particularly appealing aspect of these theories is their generality. They can be used to model a wide range of tasks, from sensory processing to high-level cognition. Most, if not all, of the computations performed by the brain can be formalized as instances of probabilistic inference. Sensory processing, motor control, decision making, learning, and virtually all higher cognitive tasks fall into this class. By treating them all as probabilistic inference problems, we may be able to derive general principles that apply to all areas of the brain. For what is real and offer, so it seems to me, is best seen as a framework whose primary virtue is to display some deep unifying principles covering perception, action, and learning. I'm moved on. Um, thus construed, an action-oriented predictive processing framework is not so much revolutionary as it is reassuringly integrative. Its greatest value lies in suggesting a deep or uh, a set of deep unifying principles for understanding multiple aspects of neural function and organization. Maybe I'll just skip to the last one, uh, or second to the last one. Um, indeed, one way to think about the primary added value of these models is that they bring perception, action, and attention into a single unifying framework Thus, they constitute the perfect explanatory partner. I've argued for recent approaches that they stress the embodied and environmentally embedded dimensions of mind and reason. And then finally, Kristen, the free energy principles and attempt to explain the structure and function of the brain. So there's a lot of, um, I think, attempts to sort of fuse explanation or sort of think about the, 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 what unification actually buys us in the context of Bayesian modeling with um, sort of explanatory purchase or explanatory power. And um, I've written a little bit about this in the past. And it just seems to me that this is a sort of recurrent debate in the philosophy of cognitive science, at least, and that there's a lot of overlap between sort of some of the arguments that, um, that people are making in, in the context of Bayesian modeling in the con that, that they've also uh, previously made or different people have made in the context of sort of dynamical explanation. So here's just a sort of quick sort of survey of, of some of these quotes, because I think it provides some useful context for this discussion. So here's Stepp, Chimera, and Turvey saying, dynamical explanations do not pr propose a causal mechanism that is shown to produce the phenomenon in question. Rather, they show that the change over time and set of magnitudes in the world can be captured by a set of differential equations. Some dynamical, dynamical models act as guides to discovery. Um, Indeed, the best dynamical explanations are 
sorry, my finger slipped. Um, indeed, in the best dynamical explanations, our initial model of some phenomena is reused in slightly altered forms so that apparently divergent phenomena are brought under a small group of closely related models. Thus, dynamical explanation can provide unification in the sense discussed by Friedman and Kitcher. Um, the best dynamical models can be used to unify disparate phenomena, capturing them under a single explanatory scheme. And I think similar claims about the explanatory import of mathematical unification um, have been made about um, other, th other kinds of, of models as well. So canonical neural computational models, network analysis models, um, and, and some others um, that I won't be able to get into. Okay, so why is this a problem? Well, I think it's a problem, and um, these are sort of arguments that I think are in the background of some of the claims that Columbo and Hartman made, why they don't really focus on this too much, but I think it's worth sort of um, worth, worth being explicit about why unification and explanation shouldn't be tied together. So the first thing is that unification is not necessary for causal explanation. And so this is uh, an argument that um, uh, Hitchcock and Woodward have made um, several times, and so the interventionist approach, approach to causal explanation, and also um, some mechanists like Craver have also made similar sorts of claims. So here's some quotes. Um, increased scope does not always correspond to explain, explanations that are intuitively deeper, Hitchcock and Woodward. Um, and so they give a really nice example um, to sort of to illustrate this point. They say, imagine a situation where you've got um, a highly conserved neural circuit and one that's found in many different organisms um, and whose behavior can be described by a set of generalizations or models, G1 through Gn. And then suppose you've got another um, highly specialized neural circuit, N2, that's found only in a, uh, in a particular species of snail um, whose behavior may be described by the same set of generalizations or models, G1 through Gn. Um, while the unification account seems to provide the conclusion that the generalizations governing N1 provide more unified and hence better or deeper explanations than the generalizations governing N2, simply in virtue of applying to more organisms, our account avoids this unintuitive conclusion. Um, so again, because according to the unification, uh, according to the um, interventionist approach, scope has very little or nothing to do with explanatory power. Instead, um, intervention, um, invariance under causal intervention is where models or generalizations get their explanatory power. Um, so what about ex mechanistic explanation? So Craver and Dyer do sort of a useful job of kind of separating out a couple different dimensions along which mechanistic models can vary. And these will be familiar to probably everybody um, who's listening right now. Um, so they just, so one dimension is completeness. So the sort of transition from a mechanism sketch to a mechanism schema, where you're basically um, filling in more details about the parts, the activities, and the features of the mechanism's organization and, um, and components but it still might have some gaps. Moving to a uh, mechanism schema, which is basically complete enough um, for the explanatory purposes at hand. Um, then you've got detail, which is sort of moved from abstract to specific. So abstraction is the process of dropping details. Specification is the process of adding details. And this is gonna have to do something with um, relevance, um, relevance to the explanatory phenomena. Evidential support, so it's a transition from how possibly models to how actually models. Um, and then scope, which is, or generality, which is the transition from a, something like narrow, or not a transition necessarily, but um, a dimension along which different models can vary from being narrow, so maybe applying to just one um, single species or even one particular individual organism to being very wide, sort of, sort of covering all organisms or covering all um, massive bodies, for example. Okay. And the important point here is that not all model dimensions bear equal weight for mechanistic explanation. So completeness and support are important. Um, so a mechanistic model is explanatory to the extent that it completely and accurately describes the parts, activities, and organization underlying the phenomenon. Um, this doesn't entail exhaustive completeness, um, but nonetheless, that seems to be where explanatory power comes from by describing um, more things that more accurate things that are 
relevant to the target phenomenon that's produced. Um, now generality is not is relatively unimportant. So completeness and support can be equally satisfied by models of single cases or n equal one systems, I've called them. Um, so something like a Rube Goldberg mechanism, or um, you know, equally well satisfied by models of ubiquitous, highly conserved biological mechanisms such as DNA or um, you know, potassium channels. So the mechanistic approach sort of basically sort of um, rejects the idea that explaining more things is, is tantamount to being more explanatory. And again, this contrasts with the unification approach, um, but it parallels other approaches like the interventionist approach, which again, discounts the importance of generality for explanation and instead ties explanatory um, power, they call it depth, to the degree of invariance, how stable a generalization is across the setting of interventions. Okay, so um, I'm gonna actually slip this, skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, so that's sort of the argument why unification um, may not be necessary for explanation. There's also, I think, powerful arguments for thinking that unification isn't sufficient for explanation. Um, so I think this is the point that, um, that Colombo and Hartman allude to in their paper. Um, and this is the fact that unification covers many different kinds of scientific, scientific activity, um, not all of which involve explanation. So there's descriptive unification where you basically just provide a, dis a descriptive or classificatory scheme. It doesn't have any explanatory objectives. It doesn't do any explanatory work. So something like Linnaean um, taxonomic classification system. Um, but you have something like mathematical unification. Um, so you basically describe a common mathematical framework or a formalism which can be applied to many different things, uh, many different kinds of phenomena. Lots of examples of that, Lagrange-Hamilton equations, um, dynamical systems theory, arguably, network theory, PCA. I'm not gonna make arguments um, for those, those things here. Um, but the fact that we can construct a common mathematical framework for dealing with a range of different phenomena doesn't guarantee that we've identified some set of common causal or me mechanistic factors responsible for those phenomena. And this is a point that, um, that, Mate that uh, Colombo and Hartman um, are explicit about as well. It's an important point. But really what matters is something like physical unification where phenomena previously thought to have quite different causes or explanations are shown to be the result of a common set of causal relationships or mechanisms. Um, but again, causal mechanism, mechanistic explanations don't have to be unifying in order to explain. So, um, so that's sort of reason to kind of sort of separate unification from explanation. But there's still sort of a question about well, what what what's the importance of unification? Lots of scientists and lots of philosophers. Um, even if they're attached to the idea that unification um, is, is directly linked to explanation, still think it's sort of important for Bayesian modeling. And so Columbo and Hartman um, kind of try to shift the tenor of, of the discussion to thinking about other ways in which um, Bayesian models might be, um, be important in, in um, cognitive science. So Bayesian models do not, pro so this is something they say, uh, Columbo says in an earlier paper, that Bayesian models do, do not provide mechanistic explanations currently, instead they are predictive instruments. Um, they'll be important in, in just a, in, in a few slides. Um, then, they, then Columbo and Hartman say, in some unification in Bayesian cognitive science is most plausibly understood as the product of mathematics or Bayesian decision theory, rather than as a causal hypothesis concerning how different phenomena are brought about by a single kind of mechanism. And then there's sort of, this is where they shift, try to shift the, the tenor of the, the discussion to um, in the following quote. So rather than addressing the issue of the conditions under which a model is explanatory, we accept that a cru crucial feature of many adequate explanations in the cognitive sciences is that they reveal aspects of the causal structure of the mechanisms that produce the phenomenon to be explained. In light of this plausible claim, we ask a question that we consider to be more fruitful what kinds of constraints can Bayesian unification place on causal mechanical explanation in cognitive science? And they're gonna focus, they, they outline three different constraints. I'm gonna focus on constraints on mechanism discovery and yeah, for some reason I left the other bullet point off, but constraints on selection and confirmation of mechanistic models. Okay. So here's what they say about constraints on uh, how Bayesian unification or Bayesian models provide constraints on mechanism discovery. 
So it provides a really useful discovery heuristic. So basically something like assume mapping or an isomorphism between elements in a behaviorally confirmed model and a neural model. And that heuristic places constraints on the search for possible mechanisms. And the quote, the basic idea is to establish a mapping between psychophysics and neurophysiology that could serve as a starting point for investigating how activity in specific populations of neurons can account for the behavior observed in certain tasks. Typically, the mapping is established by using two different parameterizations of the same type of Bayesian model. They go on to say, drawing on this mapping, one prediction is that neural and perceptual weights will exhibit the same type of dependence on Q reliability. This can be determined experimentally and would provide information relevant to discover neural mechanisms needing a widespread type of statistical inference. And they continue, more concretely, Fetch et al. 2011 provided an illustration of how Bayesian unification can constrain the search space for mechanisms, demonstrating one way in which a mapping can be established between psychophysics and neurophysiology. And so that's what I'm going to zoom in on and focus on this particular um, example that they describe in their paper, which is um, from um, Fetch et al. It's a study in neurophysiology. Okay. Okay, so just to throw out one more equation that'll be relevant, um, it's basically just another variation on um, Bayes' rule that involves not just the um, integration of the, not just the updating of the posterior on the basis of a single likelihood function, um, but rather two. And so basically this is saying something like the, the probability of, of some parameter X um, given a Q, Q1 and Q2 equals the probability of Q1 given um, some stimulus X times the probability of Q2 given so the same stimulus X times the the um, probability of X, the pr prior. So basically, um, two likelihood functions, and typically in this work on multisensory integration, um, the prior is assumed to be flat, so it drops out of the equation, and then it's just a matter of integrating the two likelihood functions to get a, um, a posterior. Okay. And so here's the data. Um, and I'll describe the study first. Um, so fetch it all. Um, investigated the neural correlates of Bayesian multisensory integration. So they recorded single unit activity while monkeys performed a heading dis discrimination task in which the reliability of the visual motion, um, so optic flow information basically, was manipulated by varying the percentage of dots in the stimulus moving coherently in a single direction. And so you can see that in the top left panel B. Um, So during the experiment, monkeys were presented with either a single cue, so either um, visual cue or a vestibular cue indicating uh, direction of motion, or a combined cue, a visual plus a vestibular cue, where the two cues were in conflict with one another. And so the vestibular cue, um, so if you look at the sort of top left panel A, um, figure A, you can see the sort of the, the, the apparatus that they used allowed for them to rotate um, to, to rotate the monkey around so it can manipulate the vestibular cue. And again, I've talked about how the visual motion cue was provided. And the monkeys were reported motion direction by saccading left or right. Uh, behavioral thresholds for the single cue conditions were used to estimate cue reliability. Um, so that's the sort of um, bottom left um, panel B. And, and then, and sorry, behavioral thresholds from the single Q conditions were used to estimate Q reliability and data collected during the Q conflict trials were used to compare the theoretical estimates, um, theoretical estimates predicted by Bayes' rule. And so what you can see is in the, the, the main panel to really focus in on is um, the right hand C and D. Sorry, I should have relabeled these. So I thought I could use my mouse cursor to point, um, which I can't. But if you look at the right hand C and D, uh, right hand figure C and D, um, what you can basically see is that when the 
So, so there's two different coherence conditions. There's a 16% coherence condition and a 60% coherence condition. So in the 16% coherence condition, the visual signal is associated with a high degree of uncertainty. Um, only 16% of the dots are moving in a coherent direction. In the 60% condition, 60% of the dots are moving in a coherent leftward or rightward direction. Um, and so what you're seeing in panel C there is in the combined condition when the vestibular and visual sig signals are in conflict with one another, um, the psychometric functions change as a function of which, which cue is indicating left versus right. <laughs> so when, when um, so at low visual coherence, when the vestibular cue is more reliable, the monkey makes more rightward choices for a given heading when the vestibular, so, so for a given heading when the vestibular cue was displaced to the right. So that's the blue trace in, um, in panel C. And this pattern is reversed when the visual cue was more reliable, so in the 60% coherence condition. So when the visual cue is displaced to the right in the high coherence condition, the monkey makes more rightward choices indicated by the sort of leftward shift of the green trace in, in, panel, in panel D. Okay. And so these shifts in psychometric functions were used to compute observed visual and vestibular weights. Okay, so now getting to the neural data. Um, so to explore the neural basis of these behaviors, Fetch et al. recorded single unit activity in um, dorsal medial superior temporal um, area, MSTD. And it's, this is an area that's, that's um, known to be involved in self motion perception. Um, and so, they recorded from neurons in this area while monkeys performed that heading, dis that heading discrimination task that I described before. Um, when they modeled the neural firing rates, they found that many MSTD neurons encoded information about Q reliability. And so the top right panel depicts a representative um, MSTD neuron. And so basically what you're seeing in the single key conditions is something like essentially like a tuning curve. Um, and this, this, this cell shows a preference for leftward headings indicated by the, um, the slope moving up into the left, leftward direction on that um, panel C, um, the, red, the red trace, um, actually all, all three of the traces in the single Q conditions, indicating that there's a, um, this particular um, neuron has a preference for, for um, leftward headings. Um, and because this neuron prefers leftward headings as a preference for leftward headings, in the high visual coherence condition, the highest firing rate occurs when visual motion is to the left. So that's the blue trace in panel E. Um, it's higher than all the rest. Um, and this cell shows the oppo opposite, um, the opposite lower firing pattern when visual motion is to the right. When the and, and at the low coherence, at the low visual coherence condition, so this is um, that again, this is this is sorry, um, D, when vestibular cue was more reliable um, and the visual cue was less reliable, options of the shift were large that were basically reversed. Okay. So, and what you're seeing in the bottom panels, F and G, are the computed vestibular and visual weights. Uh, you're seeing a histogram of weights for all the different neurons. And essentially what you're seeing is that for the high coherence condition, um, the visual weights are, are higher, so indicated by the solid black histograms. And for the, um, for the low visual coherence condition, the vestibular weights are higher and the visual weights are lower. Okay, so challenges. So first we wanna just, uh, we wanna argue that although there's a, a, there's a con con concerted attempt by Colombo and Hartman to distance themselves from the view that Bayesian models provide mechanistic explanations or at least to try to um, set that question aside, the explanatory question aside, we want to argue that the extent to which a, a given model successfully constrains the spa search space for possible mechanisms um, 
to the extent that it does that, it will convey at least some mechanistic information and therefore qualify as a partial or incomplete mechanistic explanation. So the question boils down to, can they have their cake and eat it too? Uh, we want to say no. Okay, so again, just some real basic stuff. We don't dwell on this. The mechanism sketches an incomplete or a partial representation of a mechanism that, lack, that characterizes some but not all the parts, activities, and organizational features of the mechanism responsible for reducing a given phenomenon. And mechanism sketches will be endowed with some explanatory power and are appropriately described as incomplete mechanistic explanations, something that I'm not going to argue for, but it's been argued um, repeatedly by others. So what's a constraint? Um, constraint's just a restriction or a limitation. Uh, a constraint is a finding or evidence that either shapes the boundaries of the space of plausible mechanisms or changes the probability distribution over that space. Um, so constraints can exclude, exclude regions of space. They show that some set of possible mechanisms is impossible given what is known about the components and their organization. On the other hand, the discovery of a new component, a new property or a component, or a new feature of the organization of a mechanism can open previously closed regions of the space of plausible mechanisms. So that's, this is all coming from Carl's um, book. Okay, so I'm gonna actually, I think I'm gonna, well, let me just, let me just quickly go through this. Um, so here's a really quick example. Suppose you're trying to discover something about a mechanism responsible for delivering power to the wheels in a car. And then you discover something about the maximum rate R at which the set of components, the pistons, can go up and down in the cylinders. This places a hard temporal constraint, a lower bound on the rate at which the um, intake and exhaust valves must be able to open and close. And so this finding rules out many possible mechanisms with valve components that open slower than is required. Um, so in other words, it shapes the boundaries of the space of plausible mechanisms or changes the probability distribution over that space. Okay. Um, and so now coming back to Colombo, they want to say that that should all provide an illustration of how Bayesian unification can constrain the search space for mechanisms. So it's, it should be clear that the success of a model in unifying phenomena does not imply any particular mechanism information integration. So we can all kind of agree um, that it, it doesn't mean, it doesn't imply any particular or a single uh, mechanism, but the, I think the important question is whether it implies um, some, some, some mechanism. So the model imposes constraints because, so our contention is that the model imposes constraints because it provides evidence that rules in some classes of possible phenomena, um, Bayesian mechanisms that integrate visual and vestibular information using reliability-based weightings, for example, um, and excludes others. So um, non-Bayesian mechanisms that integrate sensory information by say, just simply averaging visual and vestibular information without regard to reliability. Um, and so, so for example, they're finding that the modeled neural weights are capable of changing very rapidly. So this is the fetch finding that the modeled weights are capable of basically changing on a trial by trial basis, um, both within and across trials is inconsistent with, it, it, with the mechanism being a uh, sort of relatively slow um, mechanism like synaptic weight changes. And it's consistent with something like fast network mechanisms such as normal normalization. Um, so, so just having that kind of information allows us to sort of prune the, the space of possible mechanisms. Okay, so that's sort of um, my crude way of, uh, crude way of depicting um, this kind of pruning of the space, of the search space. So you basically start with something like all, uh, uh, I don't know, um, all possible mechanisms. So it's just something kind of like an unconstrained search space. Add in some finding like reliability dependent Q weighting during multi-sensory integration. And then you're able to sort of, um, sort of divide up the space and rule out um, a portion of it, basically a portion that um, involves non-Bayesian mechanisms and multi-sensory sensory integration. Um, Add in some other findings. So for example, the time scale of the reliability dependent Q weighting um, during multi-sensory integration. And the thought is then you can further subdivide that space. And then you're basically looking at, um, you know, you're operating, a, a, again, it's not narrowing it down to a single mechanism, but it's narrowing it down to a subset of possible mechanisms that are, Bayes, that are Bayesian in character, basically reliability dependent, um, and also operate in the appropriate time scale. Okay, so, so then basically summarizing the first challenge, mechanistic explanation and constraints are closely linked. 
If a given model M provides constraints on possible mechanisms, M by definition provides evidence that rules some possible mechanisms in and some out. If M provides evidence that rules some possible mechanisms in and rules some possible mechanisms out, M must convey mechanistic information. If M conveys mechanistic information, even incomplete information, M is at a minimum a mechanism sketch and provides a partial or incomplete mechanistic explanation. So that's our contention. Okay. Second challenge. Colombo and Hartman claim that the Bayesian framework pr can provide fruitful constraints on the confirmation and selection between competing mechanistic models. I won't be able to get into all the details there. I'm just going to have to go through it pretty quickly um, in the interest of time. But the idea is that um, there are competing mechanistic models that can be consistent with one with all the behavioral data and yet be inconsistent with one another. And this tension reveals um, that there are too many degrees of freedom in the mapping relationship between models of behavioral phenomena and neural mechanisms. And it also sort of indicates that there might be at work certain background assumptions, um, including assumptions about the appropriate level at which the mechanism might be operating, and also about the appropriate level at which the um, the um, the um, oh, sorry, and also assumptions about where in the system the underlying mechanism might um, might be located. Okay, so. So here's a probabilistic, the probabilistic population coding model with um, which Colombo and Hartman actually described in their paper. Um, so the PPC model is a dominant, dominant computational model in, in the field, and it's based on the fact that individual neurons have noisy responses. So basically Poisson-like um, noise. Um, and this means that the population activity in, in the um, response, so the population response, so um, say in the, for the sensory cue blue, up in the top left-hand corner, um, what you're basically seeing, each dot would be a firing rate for individual neurons. So you've got a bunch of different neurons that are responding in different ways based on their preferred, um, on their, their um, preference for that sensory cue. Um, so like their preferred um, motion direction um, to kind of link back to the example that we just described. And what you see is that across the population, there's sort of a, a distribution of activity. Um, and the idea is that this population activity in response to a stimulus, so the response R um, to the presentation of a stimulus, so at the sensory cue um, one, can be thought of as forming a probability distribution, in other words, the likelihood, um, which can then be combined with another population activity representing another distribution. So for example, another population that's responsive to a different sensory cue like vestibular information, as opposed to the sensory Q1, which maybe we can talk about in terms of um, responding to visual information, um, to generate a pattern of, of, of activity, so population activity, that can be then read out by a downstream population um, and can, as representing the prior. So that's what you're seeing sort of indicated in red. So basically this sort of readout. And Again, I, I unfortunately can't get into all the details about this model, but um, a basic assumption of this, of, this of this PPC model is that each distribution is represented by the activity of a distinct neural population. So there's a population that is responsive to uh, visual information, and then there's a, a separate population that's responsive to vestibular information. Um, and according to their model, the mean variance of, the distribution, of each distribution are encoded by this population activity in such a way that a population with a higher mean will naturally have lower variance um, or lower uncertainty and vice versa. And so accordingly, if you sum the two population responses, um, basically these two likelihood functions, um, you get a new population response representing the posterior that will be skewed towards the population response with the larger mean, um, lower variance, I mean, larger amplitude mean. Um, and so, so that's the sort of um, overview of this model. The problem with it is that um, the Fetchit model that we just discussed is another model that attempts to sort of um, account for multisensory integration of visual and vestibular um, information. 
Um, but the fetch model assumes reliability dependent weights. So these, uh, but the PC, the PPC model, by contrast, um, has to assume fixed neural weights on individual neurons, um, where each distinct population encodes the likelihood function or the, the reliability of each different queue. So there's no scope within the PPC model to have fixed neural weights. Essentially, the reliability dependent um, property of the PPC model comes um, by virtue of the noise and the individual responses, which then gets sort of reflected in the population activity that looks like a probability distribution. Um, so there's no scope in their model for individual weights on those individual on, sort of weights on those individual neurons that sort of constitute the population to be varying as a function of reliability of the information of sensory Q1 or 2. That's the essential point here. Um, and so I think this, we think this is a problem. So most of what Colombo and Hartman say about, um, about Bayesian unification probably providing useful constraints on the selection and confirmation of models, um, of mechanism, mechanistic models, pertains to situation where um, one candidate model is a Bayesian model and the other is not. Um, and so you could look at their paper to see what the other kind of alternative is, um, just a simple averaging kind of model. Um, but it, I, we don't think their account does particularly well with situations um, where you're kind of in a Bayesian regi regime. Um, that, and that's to say that where both of the candidate mechanistic models are Bayesian. Um, and so the question sort of one poses like, can these tensions, um, can the tension between these models be resolved? Um, and then even if it can, how uh, the way in which um, the tension gets resolved um, points to the broader role that background assumptions play um, in arbitrating among these different competing models. And so um, here's this alternative strategy um, that we think is in play. And, um, in people and researchers who are actively sort of wrestling with different kinds of Bayesian models of multi-sensory integration. Um, the alternative strategy is simply to reject, I'll be wrapping up pretty soon here. Uh, I see that we're, we're, we're about 15 minutes, well, we maybe started a few minutes late, so we're about 15 minutes in. Um, we'll be wrapping up pretty shortly. Um, an alternative strategy is simply to reject the assumption that, that these are competing mechanistic models in the first place. One way of doing this involves exploiting the degrees of freedom available in the different models and highlighting how they incorporate different background assumptions about the appropriate level at which the neural model should be specified, it's what we're calling level assumptions, and where in the system the underlying mechanism might be located, locate, localization assumptions. Um, so these results, and here's, something, here's, here's, here's one indication that this sort of thing might be going on. So this is um, Angela Lockheed et al., who's a uh, uh, co-author on that, that fetch study I um, mentioned before, it's the PI in, in the lab that, from that study. These results, reliability dependent neural weights, are not necessarily in conflict with theoretical predictions of models, PPC model, the broader context um, makes it clear that that's the model they're talking about for two reasons. First, MSTD neurons may not adhere to the model. Um, and second, the model has not considered the effects of interactions at the network level. So that's the move, is to really sort of sh highlight the fact that there are these free parameters um, or these background assumptions that can be um, varied so that the tension is resolved. So again, one way is to sort of modify background assumptions about level, the appropriate level at which um, these different um, Bayesian computations are being performed and kind of say that um, the fetch model applies at the individual neuron level, and the PPC model applies at the Bayesian, at the population or at the network level, and so there's no tension there. Um, and then the other move is to basically say that there's something like um, non-overlapping non scope of these different models. They'll say that, well, um, the, fetch, the, the neural model really applies to MST or MSTD in particular. Um, right, that's where it applies, and only there. Well, at least that's all the evidence that we have, and maybe the PPC model applies everywhere else. And so there's a way of salvaging um, or sort of reconciling this, this tension by 
by appealing to the restricted scope of the neural model and saying the PPC model maybe applies more generally, except in the case of, of um, MSTD. Um, both of those means, moves seem um, kind of um, make, a, make us pretty unhappy. And so I think it sort of indicates that there's sort of, uh, there's some issues and ways that we're thinking about constraints. And, and, and this is just our way of kind of sketching out what we think some of these issues might be. Um, so I think in the background here, what's going on is that there's sort of an assumption um, that the constraints that are operative on different mechanistic models are, are sort of what we're calling monotonic. Um, Again, in mathematics, a monotonic function is, 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 a, is a function that varies in such a way that it either never decreases or never increases. So for example, monotonically decreasing function of x is one that decreases as x increases for all values of x. Um, and so the sort of picture that we have and kind of under that uh, sort of assumption is that basically as you add findings, you incrementally shrink the space of possible mechanisms. And I think you can find evidence for this sort of view in, in Carl Craver's work. Um, and I think it's, it's present elsewhere. And I, I think maybe there's also uh, an argument to be made that it's in the, it's in the background of Colombo and Hartman's um, work too, um, although then they don't explicitly endorse this idea. But we're, we're just seeing that that's actually a problem because now we've got these two different sets of findings, findings related to this, sort of this, this well-supported computational model, the PPC model, and then also a well-supported um, neural model, the um, Fetch et al. Um, model, um, which are in tension with, other, with one another that can't both be true. Um, and so, again, the problem seems to be something like new finding, and this assumption that new findings or discoveries monotonically decrease the search space of plausible or possible mechanisms. And so we'll just sort of leave it with um, just a, really a metaphor at this stage, um, which is to think that the, the initial view that we kind of have is something like um, a jigsaw puzzle or a crossword puzzle kind of model where when you add in um, additional pieces of evidence, you're, apply, you're, level, you're adding in additional constraints for the ultimate single solution to the puzzle. I think that's the sort of model that we're, sort of, we're operating with um, in the background in these debates. Seems to me that part of what this tension is indicating and also the way in which researchers are sort of involved in Bayesian modeling are sort of um, using these flexible, um, these degrees of freedom, these, these, these background assumptions as degrees of freedom is to think more about kind of like a three-dimensional um, three-dimensional space of constraints where as you start filling in all the um, answers to get to a single solution to one side of the puzzle, you might actually open up a whole new set of um, unanswered um, questions. You might open up an entirely new space. And this is actually something that Carl talks about, but then really doesn't focus on at all in the book. And I think it's an opportunity for us to sort of um, for, for us as a field to kind of think through um, the implications of, of, of this. So again, when Carl defines constraints, he says that some constraints exclude regions of the space. They show that some set of possible mechanisms is impossible given what is known about the components in the organization. On the other hand, the discovery of a new component, a new property of a component, or a new feature of the organization of a mechanism can open previously closed spaces of the space of plausible mechanisms. So it seems to me that even the way Carl sort of initially set this up, he's sort of allowing, he, he's, he's permitting um, constraints to, to play this kind of non-monotonic role. So the idea here is that findings provide both constraints and maybe what we, it's sort of a clunky term, but maybe allowances. Um, this is just a way to kind of capture these non-monotonic changes um, on the space of plausible mechanisms. So, they're not monotonic in the sense that as you add in more and more um, evidence, you monotonically decrease the, the space of possible mechanisms. Instead, you might add some new piece of evidence or information in, and you might open up some new region of the space that was previously un unexplored. So that's the sort of idea. Just to wrap up then, um, behavioral and neural evidence can place fruitful constraints on the search space for possible mechanisms, and they provide a 
valuable heuristic for mechanism discovery. They can simultaneously improve the quality of mechanistic explanation of a given model, helping to transform it from a how possibly mechanism to a mechanism sketch to a well-supported mechanism schema. So in our eyes, these are not separable results. They're just two sides of the same coin. Bayesian models such as the Fetch model, the Fetch et al. neural model convey mechanistic information. This information is what constrains the search space of plausible mechanisms. This same information is what permits the model to qualify as a partial or incomplete mechanistic explanation. And finally, competing mechanistic models can be consistent with all available behavioral data and yet be inconsistent with each other. And this tension reveals that there are too many degrees of freedom in the mapping relationship between models of phenomena and neural mechanisms and points to the role that other background assumptions play, including level assumptions and localization assumptions about where in the system um, the underlying mechanisms might occur. And also, I think, sort of points to the need for a um, more refined account of constraints that maybe incorporates this idea of um, not just of constraints, but allowances or non-monotonic changes to the space of plausible mechanisms. Um, and with that, I will wrap up. Thank you very much for listening, and sorry if I went a minute or two over.